that's the part of their offer of what they propose to give. So the offer has a proposal, what they propose to give, uh, which has to be placed into escrow before they can participate in the contract. What they want in exchange um, uh, and the exit conditions. Uh, and then the contract in everybody else's smart contract framework, other than ours, uh, the assets put into escrow are put into escrow with the contract itself. Uh, and therefore a buggy or malicious contract um, uh, can cause those assets to be lost. Um, the, uh, with Zoe, uh, Zoe is an intermediary between the uh, participants in the contract and the contract itself. And Zoe enforces what we call offer safety. Uh, and that means that uh, each of the participants is guaranteed by Zoe that they either get what they said they want uh, or they get a full refund of what they offered, what they had placed into escrow. And then what the contract can do is it can react to a participant entering the contract and decide the assets that have been placed into escrow how to reallocate that among the participants uh, where Zoe checks that every proposed allocation must meet the constraints of offer safety. So I know that was very abstract. Let's go through some concrete code here. So uh, this is the concrete code for the, um, the atomic swap contract, which is sort of the the simplest meaningful contract. Um, Mark, can, can I ask a quick question before you jump please. into the contract? Please, um, yeah. When, when Zoe sets itself up as intermediary, does it already know which participants are interacting with each other? In no. other words, uh, if I make an offer and uh, Zoe has escrowed my side of the offer, and then you refuse it, but make a counter offer with your asset now escrowed. Obviously, my asset asset may not be appropriate anymore. My, what was escrowed originally for me? So. Um, and, and I guess that can be thought through even more generally if there's more than two people involved, say it's a market or something yeah. like that. Yeah, so, the, the, so a key part of our computational framework uh, is um, uh, what we call uh, object capabilities, which is a different way of handling permissions in a computer system. Uh, and the, the, the core idea of object capabilities is, is all rights are bearer rights. And, the, uh, the, so, and that, that the issue of who somebody is uh, and knowledge of identity is really secondary. We give the example of a car key being the right to drive my car. And the car doesn't know who's driving it. So if I need you to go, you know, uh, borrow my car and drive it somewhere, and then you need to, on the, on, in, in doing that favor for me, you need to put the car into valet parking temporarily. Uh, you, can we can you can just, I can hand the key to you, you can hand the key to the valet. Uh, nobody has to tell the car, uh, Kevin McCabe is now authorized to drive my car. The valet is now authorized to drive my car. The car doesn't check identity, um, but the key itself is the ability to drive. And by having that ability, you also have the, you're in the position to interact with the car while you're driving it. So in um, uh, Zoe, we have this concept called an invite and an invite is like the car key, 
It's a exclusively tradable asset. Um, uh, so when I say exclusive there, what I mean is that uh, with the car key, once I give it to you, I'm no longer holding it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, you, you can pass it to someone else, but, but uh, bringing it and applying it to the car is different than passing it to someone else. When you want to use it, you give it to the car. So in a similar way, when you want to, um, uh, so the, uh, the, co the contract creates invites for participating in the contract. Uh, somebody who holds an invite can pass the invite to somebody else who can claim it. Once they claim it, they have exclusive access to the invite. They can check what the invite means so they know what it is they would be joining. So it solves the authenticity problem. What is this contract and what does it mean to join it? Uh, and they go back to Zoe, which is the mutually trusted agent that they start with. There's basically one mutually trusted agent that you have to come to trust by some, some in, you know, initialization of the world means. But once you trust that, uh, uh, Bob can accept an invite from Alice without Bob trusting Alice. Bob can then go to Zoe to check the authenticity of the invite. And Bob can go to Zoe to make use of the invite, which is like going to the car to make use of the car key. Bob can go to Zoe to make use of the invite. And the way you make use of an invite to participate is in, in making an offer. And uh, the offer, um, uh, once Zoe checks that it's good and brings into escrow all of the assets that, you're, that the offer proposes to give, uh, then um, uh, Zoe announces to the contract that we now have a, a valid participant uh, in the offer. Uh, and now the contract is in a position to reallocate. So uh, let's take that through from the perspective of the contract first, and then we'll take it through from the perspective of the two participants. And this contract is the atomic swap contract, which is sort of the simplest meaningful contract. Uh, and it does just what you would expect, which is the, it has two participants, so it makes two invites, uh, and the, um, uh, the, their, their invites to be counterparties in a swap, in a, in a mutually acceptable swap of assets. So the, the contract as a whole is this piece of code which is a JavaScript function. Now, so I have to ask here, uh, who knows JavaScript? Okay. Um, so the actual function is the code that begins ZCF and then this equal greater than arrow ZCF is a parameter to the contract. Uh, ZCF in this case stands for Zoe Contract Facet. And that means it's the interface to Zoe that Zoe, that Zoe provides to an individual contract when it starts the contract. It's basically saying to Zoe, use this ZCF object to talk to me as a contract which I've started, which I have started up within my framework. So that's what the ZCF is. And then um, the rest of this between the curlies is the body of the function, is, the, is what the contract does when it starts up. And what the contract, and then the, the rest of this over here is more boilerplate. Uh, the harden 
is to um, uh, basically our workaround for a misfeature of JavaScript um, uh, that ma just makes the objects um, uh, have a tamper-proof surface as they should have had in a, in a uh, normally, but this, this is what we have to do to protect ourselves in JavaScript. And then this export const make contract is just a way to um, make, the con make this function available uh, so that you can ask Zoe to, to, to use the function to create the contract. So Zoe calls the function passing a Zoe contract facet. And then the function does the part between the curlies. And the important part, uh, often in, co in code expressed this way, you read from bottom to top. You read from the part of the code that does something, and that code will, will refer to various names that are defined, and they're defined in this scope. They're defined in the naming environment such that this piece of code can use those names. So then you look up here to say, to say, okay, well, what's the definition of the name being used down here? So what this code down here does is it returns back to Zoe a record, that's the open curly, closed curly, a record uh, of two properties, um, uh, and in this case, it, it's, it um, just uses the mandatory property called invite, and it skips the optional property called public API. And so we won't worry about public API until we see a contract that uses it. So uh, in this invite, the interaction between the contract and Zoe uh, is that the contract has to return a first invite so that when you ask Zoe, when let's say Alice asks Zoe to create a contract um, uh, providing this piece of code that we're seeing here. To, so it's there, Alice is asking Zoe, create an atomic swap contract. Zoe will return back to Alice. Well, Zoe will, well, sorry, Zoe will call this function, this function will return back to Zoe this first invite made by calling this function. And then Zoe returns that back to Alice saying, this is the invite created by the contract that you asked me to start. So Alice asks Zoe to start a contract named at Atomic Swap which is this code, Zoe starts the contract, the contract executes, creates a first invite, which it returns to Zoe, which Zoe then returns back to Alice. And now let's take a look at what this um, uh, first invite is. So over here we see a function call, the open paren, closed paren means that make, in, make first offer invite must be the name of the function. It's a function with no parameters, so there's nothing between the parentheses, but we're calling it, as they say. Um, and by the way, I know, I know I already asked about JavaScript and not many hands went up. Uh, I don't know how much programming experience you, you guys do have, uh, but I'm, I'm kind of assuming, um, uh, you know, like a Pascal or, or, or a C or something is, is just sort of, what most programming languages have in common, but if I'm using terms that are unfamiliar, like you know, function, calling function, parameters, um, all of that, body, execute, uh, please stop me. Mark, I, th I think, at least in our group, we use Python a lot, so we're familiar okay. uh, in that sense. Um, okay. Good. So it's, Good. it's going to be more syntactical things that seem strange at first, yeah. Okay, I great. See. So th this whole notion of functions calling functions and returning things to the to the function that called them and all that, all that's familiar. That's great. Yeah. Okay, so uh, 
make first offer invite. This here is just the name. The actual function is this part. And what the function does is it calls this helper function called invite and offer. So this, this is part of the Zoe framework. We're going to see this one a lot. And the reason it's called invite and offer is the contract is asking Zoe to, it's basically saying to Zoe, I want to invite someone to make an offer. So create for me an invitation that I can give to them such that they can make an offer, which I will react to. So that's why it's invite and offer. It says what it is that I'm inviting them to do. And this is the main contract, this is the main invite creating operation that we have in Zoe. And an invite has three parts to it. It's another one of these records with named fields. So uh, that's actually the um, uh, that's actually the record itself. And the three named fields are offer hook, custom properties, and expected. And only offer hook is mandatory. Uh, actually, actually, right now, all three are mandatory, but it doesn't, it's, you will, you will essentially always provide an offer hook. The offer hook is the function that is called by Zoe to, to notify the contract that a participant has joined, that somebody has used this specific offer to join the contract. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so let's let's actually just worry about the offer hook. Let's let's ignore the custom properties and the expected. Um, we'll just say the custom properties is a description of the invite uh, according to the contract, and by verifying the invite, by when Alice goes back to Zoe to verify that this is a valid invite. It doesn't mean that what this description says is accurate. What Zoe is verifying the authenticity of is this is the description according to the contract, as opposed to according to anybody else. Um, so um, if Alice makes this invite, makes an invite and gives it to Bob, and Bob ver uh, validates that this is a valid invite with Zoe, even though Alice received, Bob received it from Alice that Bob doesn't trust, Bob know, now knows that this description is according to the contract, um, which Bob can see, not according to Alice. And even though Alice created the contract, the fact that uh, Alice got the contract running on Zoe means that Bob can see the contract and Zoe is the one uh, uh, assuring Bob that this is really the contract that we're running. And, and, and therefore that, uh, that when Zoe says, and this is really the description by, by the contract, Bob can have some sense of what that means. So, um, so let's say that Alice creates the atomic swap contract and Alice gets uh, this first invite, which is uh, the, um, the invite made by this call to invite an offer. So that's the, that's what we, so that's the first offer. And now expected means that uh, that's where the contract is expressing what the shape is of the offer that Alice is invited to make. So when Alice uses that invitation to make the first offer, that first offer she must be giving some amount of an asset. Um, so just whatever she's giving, she needs to label it as the asset. 
That's just the name that she needs to label it so we can all keep straight which, which good plays which role in the contract. So think of these names as the roles that different kinds of assets play in the contract. So in this case, the contract is naming them asset and price. And what Alice gives is what we're going to call the asset. What Alice wants in exchange is what we're going to call the price. Mark, can okay. I ask a quick question? Yes, please. Um, so when you do the invite, make first offer invite, and that function gets called, I don't see a return there. So uh, how does it? Yeah, uh, glad. I'm glad. I'm glad you caught that because I did not explain it. Um, over here, when we're, we see the function syntax that I did explain, where uh, you have the parameter and then the arrow, and then an open curly for the body of the function. Uh, and then inside the body of the function, you have a return statement. So that's one, one of JavaScript's syntaxes for functions where you have and the signal that you're using that syntax is that after the arrow, there is an open curl. And that means that this is a, a set of statements and one of them must be a return statement. Now, sometimes um, uh, the, the body of the function uh, only has one expression in it for one value to be returned. So JavaScript supports a syntactic shorthand where you just put the expression itself as the right-hand side of the arrow. Um, so if, let's say it said open paren, close paren, arrow three. That's a valid JavaScript function. And it means the same thing as open paren, close paren, arrow, open curly, return three semicolon, close curly. Those two are just different syntaxes for the same thing. And the shorthand only works when all of this is just an expression to be returned. So invite offer, we're, call, we're calling that as a function. And invite offer's return value is the invite. And therefore, make first offer invite, its return value is that same invite. So that's the invite that becomes the value of this invite colon property down here, which is being returned to Zoe. Okay, that makes sense. So that's the first offer invite. And notice that in, the, in this contract, only one invite has been made so far. And that's not necessarily the case, uh, but that's often the case is that um, the contract to participate in the Zoe framework must make a first invite, but it it but it, at that but by that time it may have made other invites or it may delay making the other invites until it reacts to the first invite. And in this case, uh, the terms of the contract, in terms of how much. Alice is offering and what price she's asking for exchange in exchange, those terms are, uh, are derived from the offer that Alice makes. So because they're derived from the offer that Alice makes, um, uh, the invite for Bob won't be created until Alice makes that first offer, because the contract itself doesn't have enough information to make, because the second offer is the offer to be a counterpart. I'm sorry, the second invite is an invitation to make an offer as the counterparty. And the contract doesn't have enough information to invite Bob to be the counterparty until Alice actually makes the offer as the first party. So when, when Alice actually makes the offer, then this offer hook is called by Zoe 
that to notify the contract that the first offer has been made and enable the contract to react to that first offer. And so when, when Alice as the first party makes that first offer, the contract will in turn call make matching invite, this other function up here, where the function itself is this code, um, the, this code, I'm sorry, this code. It's the, the, the closed curly matching is, I let my editor do that for me and it's hard to do it visually. Um, but in any case, uh, so the, these, these offer hook functions are always a function of one parameter. And the parameter is something we call an offer handle. And it's a capability, it's again, sort of like a car key, uh, but it's, um, it's, there's nothing exclusive about it. It's not intended to be um, uh, something that you pass around as a, as a tradable right. It's just, it's just the, the offer handle is just something to use to get information. So this first offer handle is, means that we're, that make matching invite is the, is going to make the inter, the invite to make an offer as the counterparty. And in order for that function to make the invite to offer as the counterparty, it has to know what the offer was that the first party made. So it can derive from the first offer what the structure of the counterparty offer should be. So uh, it does that um, uh, by ZCF, Zoe contract facet. That was the, thing, the, the variable that the contract got up there when Zoe started the contract, Zoe gave, gave the contract ZCF, Zoe contract facet, as the way in which it tells the contract, here's how you talk back to me in a way that's specialized to my having created you. So this is the sort of the special relationship between Zoe and this specific contract is this ZCF object. So the contract, says get offer, it's asking Zoe, give me a description of the offer that's named by this first offer handle. So you can think of the handle as a way of naming things. It's a way of talking about a particular thing. Um, uh, uh, but, it's, but unlike a name like, you know, like, um, like Kevin, uh, it's not a string that anybody can write down. It's unforgeable. In that sense, it's more like the car key, is you can have the name if somebody gives it to you, you can't have it if nobody gives it to you. So this is naming the offer, which was the offer that came from the first party. This, this piece of code made the invite to make the first offer, Alice made the first offer. This thing names the first offer. It was provided to the hook, which is the hook down here, which is this function. So this variable is names the first party's offer. And then that the offer structure has a field in it called proposal. Um, that's the important field that, sh that shows what, the, what specifically the first party had offered. And that has, again, a want field and a give field. So this whole thing over here, this is to notice that that's to the left of an assignment. That's a pattern match in JavaScript. I don't know, I don't know Python well enough to know if it has similar pattern matches. But is like this is- I mean, can I ask quickly, Steve? Is yes, that please. Like a Decorator, do you know, or is it something else? It's not, I know it's not like a decorator. Okay. Yeah. So, but this thing is, so normally when you say const something over here equals, then what's over here, you know, const foo equals three. 
On the right side of the equals is an expression that evaluates to, the, to a value. On the left side, we typically just see a name like foo, but really what you can write on that left side is any pattern. Mm. Um, okay. And the, a name is just the simplest pattern. And the pattern is matched against the value of the expression on the right. So when you say const foo equals three, the three expression evaluates the number three. And we're going to call whatever the, the value is on the right, we're going to call that the specimen. And then the pattern on the left is matched against the specimen. And when the pattern is just a name, then the way the name is matched against the specimen is it says, no matter what the specimen is, the match is successful and I will simply become the name that we're going to use to refer to that specimen from here on within this naming scope, within this piece of code. So um, uh, const foo equals three, the value of the value three is now named foo because that's what the pattern did on matching. And then for the rest of the code, the value, um, uh, we can refer to the value foo by using the name three. So over here, we have a more complex pattern. And notice that this pattern is using exactly the record syntax. It's using exactly the same kind of syntax we saw down here, which, which is open curly, close curly, and property names uh, 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 within the curlies giving the names of the properties of the record. But over here, because we're writing it in a pattern position, what that means is I'm going to match under the assumption that the specimen is a record. So when we ask Zoe, get the offer, it returns to us an offer description, which should be a record that fits this pattern. And that record might have multiple fields, but the field I'm interested in is proposal. So in fact, this get, the get offer record returned by this piece of code has several fields describing the offer, but the only one we care about here, and this is very typical, is this is the interesting one, is what is the proposal that the first party made? So, um, so, what's, so the specimen so far has been the offer record as a whole, but then when you match the pattern with this field proposal, now we have a subspecimen which is whatever the value was of the field proposal in that record. So this pattern match has extracted part of the overall specimen to get the portion of it, which is now the specimen for the remaining match. And that's whatever the contents of the field proposal was in the offer description. So uh, that record in turn is matched against this pattern um, so this pattern says, whatever fields that record has, what I'm interested in is a field named want and a field named give. Now, this could have been written as want colon want, and then it would be see, we'd be seeing exactly the same syntax we saw over here. JavaScript has another piece of syntactic shorthand, which is any time that you would have said want colon want, where the name of the property and the name of the variable that you're binding to is the same name, you can just use the name directly without a colon. Oh. So when you see that, just think want colon want. So we're going to match the property named want, and we're going to bind it in this scope to a variable named want, and likewise for give. So, it, so altogether, what this thing does, um, now speaking about it as a high level, is it says, um, in order to invite Bob to make a, count, a counterparty offer, to make a matching offer, 
um, I need to find out from the offer of the first party what the first party proposed to give and what the first party said they want in exchange. And now those two parts of the first party's offer are bound to these variables. So now that we've got that, we can go ahead and make the offer that to make the invitation to make the offer as, as the counterpart to make the matching offer. So there's the offer hook, which we'll come back to, but now the custom properties, which are this authenticatable description, this description that you can go back to Zoe and check the authenticity of. Um, and it now uh, a field called asset that whose value is the amount that the first party proposes to give. And at this point, we know that Zoe is holding all of those assets in escrow because until Zoe has successfully escrowed those assets, the first party's offer is not visible. The first party has not joined the contract until those assets are placed into escrow. And the, and the important thing about that, that's a huge deal in this whole cryptocurrency space that we're in because the system of property in which those assets are placed into escrow might be a completely other blockchain elsewhere that in which it takes some other, some amount of time and however long it takes and how, however complex the cryptography is for the contract running on one blockchain to interact with the system of property running on the other blockchain. Uh, at this level, Zoe is the thing triggering all of that interaction to bring about the escrowing of the property on the other blockchain in a way that can be adequately trusted on this blockchain. And only once that escrowing is safe, does Alice, do, is Alice's offer recognized as an offer to participate in the contract. So at this point, we know that those assets have been successfully um, uh, uh, provided by the first party. Um, uh, and we're also telling Bob uh, this is the price that the first party wants, to, wants um, in exchange for that. And then uh, this invite desk is just a description that has the same role as this description. So that um, when Bob going back to Zoe says, well, okay, what is the invite desk? Well, first of all, what's the, what contract am I participating in? Oh, this is the contract. This is the text of the contract I'm participating in. What's the invite desk? Oh, it's this string. Well, you can just take a look at the text of the contract and see this is the only place in the contract that it makes an invitation using this script. So therefore, Bob can know, as assured by Zoe, even though he got the invitation from Alice, Bob can know that he's getting an invite that was made by this contract at this position. What would happen if you made the, the same invite desk elsewhere in the contract? Okay, then it would be visible looking at the code. In order, in order for Bob to know that it's, that it's this invite desk from this contract, he would have to look at all the places where an invite can be made within the code. Um, and that's, that can be obscure. Let me, let me, there's an adversarial issue that I wanna come back to, but let's assume for the moment that the contracts are written in such a way as to be, as to maximize their obviousness, uh, as to, to basically minimize the cognitive overhead that Bob has to go through in looking at the contract and deriving some assurance about what his invite means. So the way you minimize that is you always create, create an, inv an invite by calling invite and offer by name. So you never, 
call that function by another name. And then you always include this thing using a literal string over here uh, so that you can find it by looking for the text. Uh, you never do it, use a computed expression over there. Uh, and you never use the same name in two different places um, uh, unless you really meant to do that. And, you make, and, you, and in that case, you would try to make it clear to a reader to be aware that you're doing that. So that's the non-adversarial case uh, where the contract is written to minimize the difficulty that Bob has in looking at the invite on the one hand, looking at the text of the contract on the other hand, and trying to say, okay, given that this invite was made by this contract, what is this invite inviting me to do and what does it mean to participate in this contract? Um, now, there's an adversarial case which is, uh, in general, with secure programming, you have to worry about the, the adversarial case. But especially with contracts, uh, this is the equivalent of fine print, which is, if Alice wrote this contract, Alice might have an interest in writing a contract that Bob reads thinking he knows what it means, where Alice has really miswritten it to to mislead Bob, to lead Bob to, to derive a meaning that is not what Alice actually wrote. Um, so the adversarial code understanding problem is very, very hard. And it's hard to an extent that the entire smart contract ecosystem, including us, has not done much to prepare for. We have it on our plates. We're aware of that problem. We're going to, we're going to, we're working our way towards doing more things to help with the adversarial code understanding problem. But here's the really cool thing about Zoe, which is um, even if Bob misunderstands the contract, when Bob formulates the offer, Zoe guarantees offer safety. So um, uh, that means that even a malicious contract, one that was constructed for Bob to misread, cannot violate the terms of the offer Bob constructed. So Bob is going to take a look at this description and he's going to propose to uh, propose to give that price, um, uh, in which case he has to put up that price of whatever that money is, whatever those assets are, and has to put that, put that up into escrow. And he's saying, and this is what I want in exchange. And, uh, and whatever he, and so he'll take a look at those two terms from these properties. And first of all, he's going to say, well, actually, is this, is this a trade I want to do? Do I actually want that asset badly enough to pay this price for it? Which is exactly what he would do in a non-adversarial situation. He'd look at that anyway, because that's the question that this contract is asking him. Do you want to make this trade? And then if Bob does want to make this trade, he, he makes the offer that, this tra that, that these properties describe, um, a proposal to give this price wanting this asset, um, putting that price into escrow. And now, even if this contract is malicious, the worst that it can do is either take the price giving Bob the asset or refund the asset back to Bob. So the worst case from Bob's point of view is he just gets his, his I'm sorry, uh, I got that the other way around, is give Bob the asset in exchange for the price that, or uh, not give Bob the asset, in which case the contract has to refund the price. Uh, Zoe does not let this contract on misbehavior 
engage in any other outcome. And so, that's Mark, I, really, really cool. That, I sort of understand that. And I think uh, last time when we were going over some stuff from Alice and Bob's side, I guess you can, you can put conditional rules on how long the offer exists or yes uh, and so one of those rules have to execute before i get my money back is that correct that's or is... that's correct that's correct okay there's yeah. this, this whole other thing which i which which is actually a perfect segue because it's a natural next thing to talk about uh, which is what the exit rules are what are the exit conditions for leaving the contract is I don't get the assets. I'm sorry. I don't get. I don't get back the rights. Um, uh, I, you know, either what I um, said that I want, or get my price refunded. I don't get that until I leave the contract. And we don't want typically to build into the contract a time for closing. Or sometimes we do. So, for example, if I'm holding an auction or if I'm writing a covered call option, um, uh, in both cases, it's part of the meaning of the contract that the contract closes at an agreed time. Um, but uh, the, what you typically have is a contract, like in Thomas Swap, the, 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 the default, since this contract didn't say anything about, about the exit conditions, the default is that the exit condition is on demand. And what that means is that either Alice or Bob at any time before this contract closes can request to leave. And once they request to leave, their request, they don't necessarily leave with the contract not closed. Um, uh, but uh, we, we, ha we have this term, this we, we use the term prompt in a technical manner. Prompt might be a delay of several seconds or several minutes, depending on the nature of the underlying blockchain. But what prompt means is that it's guaranteed to eventually happen with none of the other participants having to take any further action. So once Alice or Bob asks to leave, we now know that, let's say Alice asks to leave, we now know that Alice will leave promptly and that the, the assets that Alice will, will have on exit will either be what she wanted or she will get back the, uh, what she had proposed to give that had been placed in escrow. Um, uh, uh, and so if, if her request to exit happen, is processed first, then she'll get the refund. Uh, if her request, if the, if, the, if the contract was about to close, if there was a closing action that was kind of already in the air, then completing the close might happen first, in which case Alice would have exited the contract after on closing anyway. Um, but Alice's request to exit in, in racing with the action that will close the contract guarantees that Alice is going to get out soon. Uh, so, um, uh, so this contract is on demand since it didn't say anything about that. Um, so in the happy case, as we call it, which is where everybody just kind of does what they're expected to do. None, none of the exceptional conditions happen. Nobody was unsatisfied. Oh, 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 sorry. I want to say another thing about the, this um, on demand. The other thing that's really nice about on demand uh, as opposed to a timeout is a timeout would have to be negotiated ahead of time. Alice and Bob would have to figure out ahead of time how long do they want to wait. Whereas on demand means that Alice or Bob can just leave their assets in escrow as long as they want 
until they want them back. And they can decide wh why they can decide that they want them back for reasons that only happened after they were put in escrow. And there's no default timeout. If they do on demand, these assets can sit here for five years and they're still there. Okay, so, um, so, so now if Bob makes an offer that matches this description, then the callback, the offer hook here, the thing that the contract will do in reacting to Bob making an offer is to call this function. And what this function does Mark, can is- Mark, I ask a quick question? Yeah. I, I, Please. When Bob gets the invite to make an offer, mm -hmm. they can use it only once or? That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So in, in that sense, it's very different than a car key. Um, okay. one, of, one of the contrasts we keep coming back to, uh, to remind ourselves of the many, many different forms of uh, property as tokens to, to do as, as rep, I'm sorry, as rights as representing some ability to do something is a membership card versus a, con a concert ticket. Mm -hmm. A membership card, as long as you hold it, you can continue to make use of your rights as a member without using up your membership card. Whereas a concert ticket, when you enter the concert, you hand over the concert ticket and it's used up. So the invite is like the concert ticket in that regard, uh, is you use it when making an offer. And at that point, the invite is used up, it's gone. Okay. And th that, was, that was an excellent question. So in general, uh, what the contract can do is uh, reallocate the allocations among the parties uh, in ways that satisfy offer safety, and then uh, at such at a time of its choosing, uh, uh, cause any of the parties to leave the contract. Um, there's a very common pattern, which is which the atomic swap is kind of all about, but it comes up enough that we went ahead and created a shorthand for that particular pattern, which is. These two offers should be matching offers. Um, so if so, just reallocate among them so that what, what one proposed to give, uh, it should be what the other one wants and what the other proposed to give should be what the first one wants. So just reallocate by swapping the assets. And then if that works, um, uh, uh, cause both parties to leave with an indication that everything was happy, that we had a success. Um, uh, if the, um, if it does not match, then uh, the, the swap uh, will, will simply cause, again, both of these parties to leave without doing the reallocation. And without doing the reallocation means, means that, they're, that they're leaving with the current allocation. And the current allocation is the allocation that corresponds directly to um, uh, what they put in escrow. What they propose to give becomes their initial allocation. So if no reallocation happens and they leave, they just get their initial allocation back. Um, and so they get their initial allocation back and the contract uh, uh, completes indicating that uh, we had a failure to match, uh, indicating that things went badly. Can, and it, uh, can the contract complete up to that point or is it, is it, does it need to be restarted? At this point, this contract is done. Okay. So, the, so I want to, I want to distinguish there's, there's two different notions of this contract that we're, we're, we're often 
sloppy with when we talk. In fact, I was sloppy with, which is the code versus the instance. So it's this contract instance that is now done. And what I mean by the code versus the instance is this function over this function over here that began with ZCF arrow, that function is a piece of code. That function can be called many times. So when you ask Zoe to install code, that's about the code. And you do that once for a piece of code. And we, the result is an installation of the code. And then when you ask Zoe to make an instance of the contract, that's when Zoe calls this function. So it's, it's the activity that results from calling this function. It's that activity, which is the instance. So this instance is only about making one swap. And when that swap either succeeds or fails, or somebody cancels their participation and leaves, when any of those things happen, this contract is done. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Um, can you maybe just just say uh, show them a little bit the um, the auto swap? Just you know how a little more contracted, not in as much detail, but because the documentation goes into it more. But just um, so they can sort of see if you want to make something more complex. Yeah, so the auto swap contract is actually a mouthful. Um, oh, what? You went into the oh, atomic oh, I'm looking swap. Oh, I'm looking at atomic swap again. Yeah, this is definitely too much code for me to talk through the code, but I can talk through what it's doing. Yeah, um, just, yeah, exactly. Okay. So uh, auto swap, um, uh, there's, this is a uh, automated market maker. Uh, where we call the two things that, uh, that we're exchanging, token A and token B, uh, and we create a third synthetic token, which is the liquidity token, um, which you get in exchange for providing liquidity for this automated market to use uh, in making the market. So, as a market maker, when you uh, have be, when you um, uh, want when you when you want A and propose to give B, or you want B and propose to give A, both of those kinds of requests come into the market maker, and the market maker will try to satisfy those requests, um, but not at exactly the price you asked for. It will, and this is a great example of offer safety versus other damage that a malicious contract might do. Um, which is uh, when you make the offer, what you say you want is the limit price. Uh, and the limit price, so, uh, the contract, even if it's malicious, cannot violate your limit price but you're not going to the market maker in order to simply get your limit price. You're going to the market maker because you want the current market price. And in order to know that you're getting the current market price, you have to understand what the contract says. And that's where we face the adversarial code understanding problem. Now, what the auto swap market maker does is um, is preserve the, um, uh, the invariant that uh, there's some constant K such that the amount of token A 
times the amount of token B equals K. And that turns out to be a bizarrely good market making rule. I mean, that was really quite a clever invention. Um, uh, so if right now there are 10 units of A and there are 10 units of B, um, uh, Alice might come to the market maker saying, um, I propose to give you another 10 units of A and all I want, and my limit price is I must get back at least one B. Now, the market maker says, okay, right now, before I act on this offer, I've got 10 and 10, which is 100. Um, if I act on the offer, I would have 20 of A. So how much B, um, uh, right, how much B do I need which is I only need 5B. So what the, so the market price for giving, uh, the market price of what you can buy for 20A, that market price is 5B. So if this contract is honest, if it is the auto swap market maker that it claims to be, then Alice, coming to it with that offer leaves getting, um, uh, getting 5B, even though she only said she wanted 1B. So we're making an assumption here, which is, is the proper term a Geffen good? We're making this assumption that if you say you want N of something, uh, it's always acceptable to give you more than N, that you can't um, we can't violate what you want by giving you more, more of what you asked for. Um, and we obviously we know that there are situations where that's not true, but that's all that Zoe guarantees. So this is, uh, again, the, this principle like getting the market price, where it's not that Zoe is taking care of all of the risk, is that we're partitioning the risk. We're saying Zoe takes care of the offer safety and then everything beyond offer safety that you're counting on, you have to understand the contract. Uh, and, if the, and if you misunderstood the contract, then those additional parts of offer safety might be violated. Mark, can I ask that a slightly different way then? Um, so, you know, in a market like this, I might, I might say bid 100 for an item and I might find out that I only have to pay 60 at the end. Um, okay, so uh, so that would be that would make me happy, but I escrowed 100. Uh, so are you going to give me so 40 back? Is that yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, and in fact, the right contract to use to make that point really well is our public auction contract. We'll see if that's more tractable in terms of code. Much more tractable. Um, so this is a second price auction. Uh, okay. Now, in order, to, um, uh, in order to participate in a second price auction, in order to make an offer, you have to escrow enough to cover the entirety of your bid. So, so offer safety only guarantees you the, the, the safety that you would expect from a first price auction. Um, but then if it's an honest second price auction, then you get some of your bid refunded. So you can get uh, more of what you wanted and you can get some of what you bid refunded uh, and both of those have no limit. Uh, if, if the allocations work out, you can actually get more refunded than you put in of what you propose to give. 
and you can get as well as getting more of what you wanted and you can get all of those at the same time. Because as long as it satisfies offer safety, it satisfies the conditions that Zoe is enforcing. So if you're doing a second price auction, then a malicious second price auction might charge you the first price rather than the second price, uh, but it can't charge you beyond your first price. It just can't because you didn't put more than that into escrow. Um, uh, it might give the good to somebody other than the top bidder. Uh, the seller who placed the bid for sale in the auction, uh, the amount that the seller said they wanted is used as the reserve price, which is just another way to say limit price. So Zoe, again, can't violate the seller's reserve price um, because the seller will be refunded whatever good they placed in, in escrow with the auction to sell to the top bidder. Um, will either get the good back or they get their reserve price. Uh, oh. No other reallocation will be acceptable, but they might not get anything higher than the reserve price. And the, the a dishonest auctioneer can arrange a artificial participant that gets all of the surplus. So there's a variety of ways in a second price auction that you can be cheated, but um, the, the offer safety is still a tremendous limit on the risk, uh, limit on the hazard of what you have to worry about if you misunderstood the contract. Have you uh, implemented a double auction um, like you would have for, for an order book? Yeah. So let's talk about a continuous double auction, um, which we certainly intend to build. We haven't built that yet, but it's perfectly compatible with Zoe. And it's rather beautifully expressed within Zoe, uh, except that it needs one further bit of expressiveness that we haven't talked about, um, which is the multiples. So right now in Zoe, an offer is atomic. If I say, I want to buy uh, 10 shares of IBM, for $1,000, then um, uh, the, um, the auction that I said that to um, uh, can either give me my, you know, the $1,000 $1, place of escrow. It, if it's not going to give me all 10 shares, it has to give me the 1,000 back. One thing it cannot do under the current Zoe is give me five shares of IBM for $500 and give me the other $500 back. Um, so, there, so there's an atomicity. It has to do an all or nothing of the entirety of the offer. And if you try to write a continuous double, double um, auction where the matching of the overlap has to honor that form of arbitrary atomicity, you have a mess. You have, it becomes really hard to write a double auction that does that. So uh, what you want, uh, and which we don't have yet, this is the reason why we, um, uh, after doing some prototypes, why we didn't actually put a double auction into production, uh, is we, we can't yet say this is a divisible offer. And, that, um, and by saying it's a divisible offer, you enable, uh, uh, you're in saying that you're enabling Zoe to take some, to uh, honor some portion of the offer by giving you proportionally, um, uh, you know, yeah, you, you understand. I don't have to go into yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, that, this, is the pro this is the problem with double options. The, and if I'm understanding you correctly, the, the simple case is where I have to take a particular bid or offer in its entirety when I match. Um, but usually the way that they're implemented is if I bid 20, it'll take the first 10 in right. the book and then the first 10 further on. I've always thought that you can, the client can kind of take responsibility for that. So the fact that, I mean, it's possible for me to have 
um, if you're forcing exact matching, then I can have um, bids which are higher than offers, which are still in the order book, which is like you say, a mess. But in a way, I mean, people can kind of figure it out and they can look and see where the, see where the bids and offers are um, or they can have another piece of code on top of it, which takes care of that for them so that it doesn't have to be accounted for in the contract. You don't have to do, like you say, these complicated partial, um, I guess, permissioning for you, for you to allow a contract to do that. So yeah. but you, that is the, your, the, your plan will be to implement it. Right. The other, the other thing you, you can remember is that there would be forms of double auctions that could uh, could accept combinatoric mm. yes. offers. Yes, yes. And um, that and would and allow you to stay within the, your space now, so. Yeah, so, uh, so the combinatorics we can support right now, the divisibility we do not yet support. Mm -hmm. uh, and the combinatorics is still an all or nothing. So an individual offer here um, might be within this give record. There might be multiple fields like this. Within the want record, there might be multiple fields like this. And Zoe still enforces offer safety where either the entirety of the give is satisfied or the entirety of the want is satisfied. And the right. entirety of the give, give has to be put into escrow up front. So we already do that. Yeah. We don't, okay. I mean, when I say okay. we do it, we haven't written such a combinatorial auction, but, but Zoe is able to support it perfectly fine within the framework. Yeah. Yeah. And just to, just again to, on that point, it, so it is very possible to have a double auction in Zoe currently um, that just doesn't deal with, um, with, with, part, with partial fills. That's right. Um, and That's there right. were exact matches. Um, so you could have yeah. that. And that it seems to be very simple. It's just like an extension of the atomic swap, but which allows. Well, one thing so, that's problematic so, that I see is uh, order withdrawals. So if I'm allowed to exit my order whenever I want, but I'm currently holding, say, the standing bid or standing ask in the auction, then my withdrawal is more meaningful, right? I can actually affect the way the market's operating by doing that. So, um, uh, so, uh, so the 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 three exit conditions, the three form of exit conditions. So that's all about the exit conditions. The three forms of ex exit conditions are we already talked about on demand. Um, uh, the, the, the next one is after deadline, where there's simply a deadline and, and whatever, the situ whatever the allocation is as of the deadline, uh, everybody, sorry, not everybody, that player is, leaves the contract after that deadline with their current allocation. So the covered call option is the example of that, um, uh, which is the, the, whoever wrote the covered call option they either get their money or they get what they put into escrow back exactly when the contract expires. Um, uh, one of the things that we anticipate doing, we expect to do, uh, but we have not done, is to mix the concept of after deadline and on demand, which is after the deadline, you're not, you're not forced out it's that after the deadline, you now have the right to leave on demand. Mm, so, yeah. um, but we don't, we don't yet support that. Uh, but I, th I think that will be useful. Uh, and then the final one is waived. And waived means I have given up uh, Zoe enforced assurance about when I will get out. I still have the assurance that whenever it is that I get out, I get out honoring offer safety, but I might never get out. If I waive my exit conditions and I enter into a malicious contract, it might just stay stuck forever. And that's what I agreed to. Um, so in that case, the adversarial code understanding problem is that I need to understand 
under what conditions the contract says I can leave uh, in order to understand when I will get out when I said waived. Because I'm just waiving the ZOE enforcement. I'm now depending on the contract. Is there, you so, know, this is thinking out loud, but there might be a reason to have on-demand contracts that can only be executed, or on-demand exits that can be executed as long as you're not causing some externality condition. That is, you check a condition and you say, if this condition doesn't hold, then you can exit on demand. If this condition currently holds, then you can't. Right, so that would be a perfect example where you would say waived because Zoe is not in a position to know, to understand those, those conditions. And right. therefore there is no, there is no exit safety or, or um, what we call payout liveness. Uh, there is no such, in, 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 for that kind of contract, there is no such thing that Zoe can enforce. But what you could say is that uh, the after deadline is something ridiculous, like after a year you get your assets back, but we're expecting the contract to close within a few minutes. Uh, and that way, um, uh, you're depending on understanding the contract, understanding that you'll leave when the condition is satisfied. But if you misunderstood the contract or the condition is never satisfied, you're not stuck forever. So after deadline is still a way to put a limit on how badly your, your assets are stuck if you misunderstood the contract. Here's a, here's a question, it's still a little unclear to me how this would work, but in the double auction again, Say I'm a buyer and I'm making a bid and I put a bid in uh, and then I want to make another bid because that first bid wasn't accepted. So I, okay. I raise the amount I, I'm willing to pay and I, I put another bid in, but I, now I have that first bid in right. as well. Right. So I'd, I, I either want to withdraw that first bid if my second bid gets accepted, or or maybe I want to leave it in as my next bid if my you know first bid or if second bid gets accepted. Uh, but it, it's kind of depends on my circumstances, which I would want yeah. to do at that point. So we do not. That, that's a very that's a very nice example uh, because you just asked for an atomicity guarantee that Zoe does not provide uh, as, uh, as, the, as the, the one who made the first offer, uh, if it's an on-demand exit, you can ask to exit, uh, you can place a second offer, the offers are independent. Um, uh, you could ensure that both, if you're worried that both offers might be taken, um, then you could wait until you see that your first offer successfully left before placing the second offer. But you can't do that and get the opposite guarantee um, that the first offer doesn't leave until the second order enters. Right. Um, we don't provide anything like that. And there's, there's th that atomicity condition means in a sense, there's no way I could rebundle. So what I might do is make my first offer and then say, well, when I make my second offer, I really want it to say first offer or second offer, but not right. Okay. But not okay. both. Very, very, very good. Um, so uh, our, our current, so you're bringing up a case actually that that exceeds our current plans. It's what the the expressiveness uh, that we were anticipating, but we were anticipating something very close to that. Mm -hmm. um, which is that um, what we call um, exclusive choice, uh, which is uh, you can put in a single offer that is an or an exclusive or an exclusive choice between several different proposals where you're saying, I would be, um, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm fine with any of these alternatives. So if you satisfy any of these alternatives, you've satisfied my offer safety. Uh, but um, it's different than making multiple independent offers because I make multiple independent offers, 
multiple of them might get satisfied. Exactly. And I might, I might be, I might want to say, I only want at most one of these satisfied. All the others should get a refund only. And so we're expecting to do that. Uh, and you've now touched on essentially exactly the two forms of additional expressiveness that we've anticipated, which is the divisibility and the exclusive choice. Uh, this thing about adding alternatives after an offer has started is not a case that has come up and it's not a case that the architecture we have in mind uh, uh, that I know how to accommodate within that architecture. Right, because it seems like it would violate this kind of basic atomicity need. Although I suspect maybe you can create a contract arrangement that says at the time I want to make, a, if I want to make a new offer in something like a double auction, uh, I can at that time on demand rescind all my other offers and re-enter a combinatoric offer that has the element okay. I want so, in it, so. Yeah, so so I actually gave you um, not the best, the, the best way to answer your question. Um, so a better way to answer it is that the guarantee, Zoe is a fixed mechanism and it needs to be a fixed simple mechanism because it's the thing that everybody has to trust that it's doing its job accurately. Right. Um, so it's only providing a certain degree of assurance and any remaining assurance can again be up to under, up to the contract and you understanding the contract. Right. So the, the, the vision that you're looking for is one that you can write a contract that in the contract's behavior provides exactly that behavior that you're looking for right. as long as the behavior you're, that, the, that you're asking the contract to do is consistent with how the offers are expressed uh, at the lower level that Zoe understands such that the outcomes can still satisfy the Zoe expressed offer safety. So uh, an atomic, alter, uh, atomic alternatives where the alternatives arrived late you could write a, you'd have to write the contract to know about that up front. It wouldn't just happen magically for a contract that didn't know about that, but a contract that knew about that and intended to support that could do that because the allocations that that condition asks it to bring about are still condition are still consistent with the underlying offer safety. Right. One thing that, uh confuses me off and on and still confuses me a little bit is the difference between the rules of the game, the implementer of the auction who might use Zoe and the things that get escrowed in Zoe uh, and use the protection rights. So, and the reason why it's a little weird is because it's not just a contract, but it's things like bids and asks the messages can become contracts in Zoe. Um, so the it, so the 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 um, so in Zoe we mean we mean uh, very specifically what we mean by a contract in Zoe is something that fits in this framework the way I described. Um, but this expected thing over here. Um, uh, what that's, say, what that's doing is it's telling Zoe, um, uh, if the offer that's actually made using this invite, if it doesn't have this shape, then don't even tell me about it. Just mm -hmm. reject the offer. Uh, so that way the contract can easily say, I'm a contract for, for offers of this shape. And if somebody uses this invitation to make an offer that's not, a, not in this shape, I want to ignore it. Right. Right. Mark, I have a question. We have sometimes a situation where the, the price um, that's acceptable for a particular contract depends on um, the contracted and open offers in different markets. 
Um, this right. is this so that, that, so, exchange margining. Yeah. So this this is the um, most painful truth about the Zoe architecture, is that the price of something in an external market is not something that Zoe that there's no neutral way to know what that price is. So um, not in the external market, maybe even in an internal market. So the example being, if I could have like a put and a call option. Um, now, the total amount of margin that I need to put up will depend on whether I have both the put and the call option together um, or just one or the other. So both contracts being in Zoe in some sense um, they're different contracts, but within Zoe, can they talk to each other in, in the sense of the the price that the price be a function of what's going on with other contracts inside the same box? Uh, so, so, uh, so these contracts can be put in, um, and they can communicate. Um, uh, we haven't actually done that. We know there's a lot of interesting cases where we, we're planning to do that. Uh, and therefore, something like an auto swap can be used as a price oracle um, uh, for something like a, um, a, a, you know, a, a um, collateral, any kind of collateralized thing that depends on an external price. You can do that by having contract, a contract talking to a price oracle and the price oracle itself could just be another contract that creates incentives for an honest price. I see, I um, see. So just but, 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 the, but, the, but the important thing about all that is this, is this is an assurance with regard to market price, which is not something Zoe can guarantee. I'm sorry, you, you held up some text there. Uh, you're I'm muted, I'm sorry. It, I have to go up, I'll... Uh... Uh, I'll touch base with Kevin uh, at the end of the meeting, and I'll uh, um, and I'll see you all next week. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we are kind of at the end okay. of our allotted time. Um, okay. Yeah, and I, ha I have another meeting actually uh, starting right now as well. Well, Mark, this was extremely helpful. Um, so um, you know, I think as we continue to get more into the code and more into the philosophy of Zoe, it's going to be easier for us to see what we can and can't do. And that'll be great. Yeah. And also just, just want to point out that the, um, uh, if you haven't looked at documentation on our website lately, it's, um, it's been updated uh, quite recently and it's been, I think they're still working on some of it, but it, it but it has like the latest code with sort of all the, all the changes we've made into the API and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. So, so actually a that's now. a very, that's a very good point. Since everything we just went through is still fresh in your head. Um, if you re if you read our documents now, it's more likely to, uh, reinforce those memories before they before they start fading. That's a good idea. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, All right. yep. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.